welcome to this week's Lessons in Leadership from Hoffman Reed. Um, we're back after a, a little bit of a hiatus for the uh, Christmas break, and this week we've got a real treat for you. Uh, we've got John Shillman, Chief Executive of Railpen, here with us today. John, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks, and it's great to be here, Paul. Um, John, the first question I always ask everybody is, could you sort of give us a couple of minutes overview of your career about how you've actually got to where you are so that people who are thinking they would like to end up in the chief exec chair one day, that they've got an idea of the sort of journey you've taken and maybe some of the, the challenges you've faced along the way? Yeah, of course. Uh, it's I don't think anybody when they, they sort of start their career thinking, oh, I'm going to end up as chief executive. But let's just give you a, a potted history of how I got there. And uh, I I was first generation of uni from my family and I left uni not knowing what I wanted to be. So I took the view that I will qualify as something, uh, knowing that ultimately I wanted to end up in business. So I qualified as a chartered accountant and uh, then spent about 10 years in real sort of financial roles, uh, specializing in change, uh, turnaround, M&A, those sort of things. Uh, and then having made myself redundant and then being potentially sort of pushed in a direction of going to work for Shell in Nigeria, which didn't sound very attractive or with a one-year-old daughter. I looked at the options and uh, I saw a great job. It was around change again. It was around project management. It was about moving on a, a business, uh, advertising the FT. And I applied for that job. And the day before I went for interview, they told me, oh, by the way, it's in the pensions department. And that was my introduction to pensions. And I was successful in getting the job. So I ended up in pensions by an absolute accident. Uh, really fortuitous one. I'd say it's the happiest thing that's ever happened to me. But that's how I landed in pensions. I don't think many people have pensions on their sort of wish list when they leave school or uni. Of, I must end up in pensions. But that's how I got there. And, and largely over the next 20 years, approximately, I worked within large multinational corporates, uh, Shell, HBOS, National Grid, First Group, uh, often in a pure pensions role, uh, but sometimes in a double-hatted role as well. Sometimes I was also the group head of rewards, so I did Renko stuff and all the other benefits that were on offer to staff. So I had some really interesting experiences. But alongside that, I was also sitting there as a pension trustee for many companies, uh, sort of some of those in my employers. But also I then started uh, becoming a trustee of the Railways Pension Scheme back in 2007. And I became an independent trustee, enjoyed the Nestle Scheme in, in 2016. So I had a, a bit, bit of breadth of experience about sort of both sides of the equation, the corporate side and the trustee side. Uh, and I found both particularly interesting and uh, being an accountant, the corporate side always really appealed to me because it was about, yeah, trying to improve things, trying to reduce risk, trying to get better outcomes for members, but not to kill the company at the same way, same state. But uh, on the trustee side, I could see the pressures there to say, say some of the things were very complimentary with the company, but some meant you were butting heads. So quite an interesting challenge. But uh, when the chief executive of, of Railpen, who only recently put in, decided that he was uh, going to move on to AIG, great role for him. Uh, and it, we were looking almost for a continuity candidate. At that point, I threw my hat in the ring to take on this role, given that at National Grid, I was running something very similar in terms of scale and size of assets. Uh, but really, that was what introduced me to this CEO role. And so I've been doing this for about two and a half years. And it's a surprise for me that I was doing it. I never thought I'd end up as a CEO. Uh, and like all sort of people, when you take on a new job, you're, if you feel a little bit of a fraud, there's a bit of imposter syndrome of, can I really do this? But actually, uh, you settle in and you recognize, actually, you can do this and you can bring some things to the, the table. So I would say I'm very lucky. I feel very fortunate to be doing the thing I'm doing. And I feel very fortunate because I'm doing it inside an organization that is very purpose led. And, and for me, that is a very important part of my DNA. I don't want to get out of bed and just do a job because it's uh, paying me enough money to live comfortably. I want to do a job because it actually makes a real difference to the people we serve or the society. So uh, that's something that there's a massive alignment in this particular role, Paul. Mm -hmm. What would you say have been some of the biggest um, challenges you've faced along the way and, and, and how have you overcome them? A lot of the challenge is about uh, understanding about what you want or need to achieve. So some of the challenges have been in, inside corporates where you've 
particularly now when most of the CFOs are younger than I am, uh, they don't have the exposure to and the background around particularly defined benefit schemes. And it's actually trying to persuade them, one, the value of what pensions are, but actually they can't just ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. These things need to be actively managed. And sometimes that means uh, you need to do certain things that might be counterintuitive to them. Uh, asking them to raise bonds to put money into a pension plan just seems a completely counterintuitive thing to most CFOs, but something that you might need to do. So most of my challenge in the corporate world has been about, uh, about changing people's mindsets, both around the value and actually uh, what they might need to do to get to the end game on some of these things. Uh, often there was just a case of let's go into battle. Let's let's sit here and we'll fight this valuation and three years times there'll be another one and we'll fight again as opposed to where do we want to be? So for me, I'm always looking for a long-term strategy. That's very important. If you haven't got a long-term strategy, uh, you're never gonna be able to deliver it. So it's very important that I could explain that strategy clearly. And it's often been the case of uh, the time horizons that I'm thinking in don't necessarily uh, align with the time horizons of the CFO or CEO in an organization in the past because they are looking at thinking, well, I'm here for three to five years. Uh, I don't really care if the guys haven't got a pension in 20 years time because it'll be somebody else's issue. Or indeed, I'm not gonna be here for the end game. I want great financials on my watch. So that's been one of the real challenges, the differences in the time horizons between, uh, between various stakeholders and trying to get the right outcome. And of course, then the world throws on other things like COVID in the last uh, two years, and you're suddenly fairly new into a, into a job as CEO and you're trying to run the business virtually. Uh, and uh, those, those in themselves are, are really sort of marked experiences. It's been a, been a challenging first role as a CEO, it's mostly said, but, but hugely enjoyable. And, and you mentioned COVID there, and it's probably one of the biggest leadership challenges of our time for most people moving from traditional operating models to digital operating models and a huge digital transformation project that people have under, undergone. How did you kind of adapt your working environment and move from an environment where, you know, you, you had all your staff predominantly office based to predominantly being at home? And, and what were some of the hurdles that, that threw up along the way? Well, it, yeah, it, it was we were sort of at that time, we were almost two different businesses. We were a London business that was a very much asset managers where people could almost work where they like. They all had laptops. And we were an administration business in Coventry and Darlington where people were tied to desktops. Now, we had some foresight and we had some luck. And I think that's what all businesses need. So the, the luck was that uh, we had just put in a new uh, admin system or just concluding putting in a new admin system. And that admin system enabled off-site working. Uh, so the previous systems wouldn't have allowed it. Uh, and the bit of foresight was that as this thing started in China in the end of 2019, we sort of spotted something happening and we'd ordered 150 laptops, basically for anybody that hadn't got a laptop in the organization to have a laptop. So we were able to mobilize the, the off-site working very, very quickly which uh, had we waited until, was it March, when everybody started saying, you've got to work from home now and try to order laptops, we wouldn't have got them. So we were lucky there. We we're a bit ahead of the game. And that's generally where we've been in the market. We've been sending people home earlier. We've been bringing them back a little bit more, a little bit later, a bit more controlled environment. Uh, but then we've been spending a lot, of, a lot more time and effort supporting them in that offline environment. Uh, the amount we've spent on well-being and the amount of time we've given to well-being has been massively increased over the last couple of years, uh, whether that be sort of uh, discussion around menopause or about stress or about mental well-being for men. Uh, there's been a whole range of things that that we've really tried to engage with, recognising that that actually a lot of people's sort of safe environment is often the office. They've got issues at home anyway. They come into the office, they can talk to people where they can just have a night, as well as doing their work, they can have a nice chat with people. And there wasn't really that, uh, that avenue either. So while we've been spending money in that area, we've also been trying to encourage people to do coffee roulette and things like that, to just spend some time chit-chatting. In other words, the water cooler conversation, the, the having your sandwich conversation that people wouldn't, uh, to try and engage that sort of uh, community that's very valuable when you've got a purpose-led organisation like Railpay. So that's been really 
interesting and challenging. And I think one of the most important things that's played out is that when we've had some of these uh, mental well-being type workshops, it's not just been people at the, the sort of lower levels in the organisation that have been talking about their challenges. It's been the people all the way up to XCOM. And that's really sort of said, oh, right. So just because you earn a bit more than me doesn't mean you're immune to these sort of issues. We all feel them. And so that's been really good in terms of bringing groups together and saying, oh, they, they understand my, my issues because they feel them themselves or they've experienced them themselves. So it's been a, been a really important, uh, important learning curve there. But I think overall, Railpen's done pretty well. Our service levels have held up incredibly well. Uh, and the challenge has been stopping people working too many hours, to be honest. I mean, people say, well, I'd have left the office, at, I'd have left work at... Uh, six o'clock to get the train or five o'clock and I'd have got home at seven. So I'm quite happy to work that time. And, and, and we're probably getting to that. We got to that level where we had to say, tell people, just work your normal hours. We, we, we've had increased productivity as you be, being at home, but actually that's not what you should be doing. It's not good for you in the long term. So that's been another one of the challenges. Uh, but we are sort of, a, as an environment, we try not to be massively rules-based. So we're quite flexible in terms of when people work, recognising that this this working from home and trying to keep teach your kids at the same time was really difficult. So we have been quite open in saying, actually, provided you to get your work done, we're not doing a time and motion study on you. Uh, we're going to measure your outputs, not your inputs, and, and, and find the best way to work for yourself. And that's something we've adopted as we've come back to the office as well. So using activity-based working, yes, we're now a much more fluid business. Uh, we've got more collaboration space. We're not demanding you work, you're there Monday, Friday, nine, nine to five. You come in when it makes sense for you to come in, when you need to collaborate, when you need to do things in the office, when you've got meetings, when it's best to work at home, whether it's writing reports, reviewing, whatever, you work from home. And so I think people have people have appreciated that flexibility and uh, it has helped the business move on. And I say one of the positives of, of the pandemic have been that I think the way business have organised has moved on five to ten years from what might have been the, the, the slow incremental progress we were making up to that point. And it, it, it's interesting there. I mean, you, you, you covered so many parts of that answer. It, it, it's just fascinating. Um, but some of the, the, the late stuff that you touched on there, activity-based working and outcome-based working, that's a real change for businesses compared to where, where they were two years ago, two and a half years ago, where it was, or based on input rather than, than output. Yeah, look, I, I, I've always been a more output based person. Uh, I personally work quite hard and work quite fast. And I, I've never sort of this, this presenteeism is not something I've wanted to encourage, but I've recognized it's been endemic in some businesses for quite a long time. <clears throat> what we really want is for people to work as efficiently and smartly and the best way they can. And, and we feel through activity-based working, you can make that happen. Interestingly, when I do go into the office these days, I do like to be in the office quite a bit because I'm quite a people person. I realise that I don't get much work done at all now. All the time I'm spending talking to people, having those sort of offline discussions, actually at the water cooler or, have, or leaning over someone's desk. I'm learning a lot about what's going on in the business, but I'm not actually doing my sort of, if I need to write a, a CEO report for the board or whatever, I'm not getting that done in there because... That's, that doesn't make sense. But yeah, we, it's hard for some people because there are certain groups and certain individuals that would like hard and fast rules. And they, they makes them easier for them to manage their jobs. So being that sort of more relaxed and fluid uh, structure is hard for some managers. And I think that's where, if you like, we've still got some learnings to do. It's around empowering our managers and giving them more skills to have those conversations about well if somebody is taking the mic and not really putting the work in how do you recognize that and what and how do you talk to them in the right way because that's not the skill that all managers have necessarily got and born with but uh we we wanted to do that more in a face-to-face -face environment because it's the sort of thing where getting some actors in and doing some role play really works just giving somebody an hour lecture on how to do it isn't as effective. So we've still got some work to do there to make that really work and to, to enable our managers. But as a business, the vast majority are embracing this uh, because they can see it as a much more positive. And we've seen some people who said, right, I recognise this. I don't need to live in central London anymore. I'm now I'm moving 150 miles away and I'm going to commute in on the days I need to. And I can still be better off because I can have a, a bigger or a better house or a smaller mortgage and uh, being on the 
every, a couple of days a week when I when I need to. And uh, I think that's that's an advantage, which will see us being able to recruit people in different parts of the UK, as opposed to being uh, absolutely restricted to having people that can commute into Darlington, Coventry or London. Yeah. You know what, you're exactly right. I was speaking to a client this morning about this exact subject and, you know, their, their headquarters is London. Um, and they said, well, you know, in an ideal world, we want people to be able to commute to the office because they're still going to need to come here. It's a senior exec role. However, we anticipate that people might live further afield now and that widens our talent pool. So as long as they can get here when they need to be, um, you know, the last two years has taught us that that can work. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Zoom teams, they've all put a lot of effort into making these sort of interactions more uh, effective. I mean, I think the challenges are what you don't get is the is the the small talk around it. All these time, unfortunately, spent much more focused on the meetings and those contents. And that's where people have lost out, particularly people that might live on their own and actually need some of that small talk. So one of the things I'm always trying to do is, is spend the first five minutes of any conversation just finding out about how are you feeling? How are things going? What's going on in life? Because otherwise, a lot of people are missing out on that. I'm lucky. I've got a family. I live in a house with a garden. I could always get out when we're in lockdown. But I know there's many that have been a, a lot less fortunate than that and have been in shared houses or just in a in, got a room in a shared house and they've got to work on their bed and... Uh, there's no escape, and, and that's a very difficult thing to thing to thing to to cope with, really. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And you know, I I have a one year old, uh, um, so so working from home in in lockdown wasn't necessarily the easiest of things for me because uh, one year olds don't really care what you're trying to do and uh, and when you're trying to do it, they you know if they need feeding or, or whatever, that, then it needs to be it needs to be there and then. Yeah, I feel very fortunate that my children are somewhat older. But uh, even then, I mean, I had a daughter who was finishing uni, uh, really lost the last six months of uni because sent home, did, did the next year of uni and went in for one day. Uh, and, mm. and that was it. And, and it has been very difficult. And there is a, it's going to be more challenging for recruiters as we try to assess people coming out of this model where potentially kids have not had normal school for three years how that will impact their next level of education and, and some other social skills as well as they've lost some of those, particularly if they're sort of going in at younger ages into primary school. So hopefully they'll catch up, but we've got to recognise that challenge for the future generations as well. Yeah, I'm, I, absolutely. I think it, it's fascinating. And we, we've had various conversations on this uh, podcast with, with leaders around, um, around, people entering the workforce for the first time so it's so a graduates or school leavers coming in and the way that they're missing out on the social interactions and the learning so it's not necessarily the formal learning where you sit down and you taught something or you do role plays but it's listening to your colleagues on a phone call or watching them and observing them in the way that they work and the way that they do things which you just can't physically get sat behind a computer screen I absolutely. And, and look, I trained as a chartered accountant. I learned all the time from the seniors above me by just hearing how they asked questions, how they approach things. Uh, you, yes, you can go in the course that says, oh, you need to ask an open question. But when you hear it and you can understand, you can feel the rapport and you can understand how that you move on to the next question and then dive a little bit deeper. Those things must be really challenging for those who've been a couple of years in actuarial or accounting or legal profession where uh, you learn a lot from your peers. It's not all book work. Yeah, absolutely. I know for me, unless I've got a confidential call, I'll often do all my calls on speakerphone so that the, the team around can hear and listen and learn how I do things so that they, they can pick up hints and tips. And sometimes they'll say to me, well, why did you say that? And I say, oh, I said it for this reason. I say, oh, I, I wouldn't have thought of that, but I'd have probably done it this way. And they'll give an equally valid way of, of handling it. But it's just that that interaction that you, you miss when, when you're not with each other. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what would you say have been the sort of key leadership lessons you've learned throughout your career then, John? Well, I think there's a couple of things that, that really sort of identify a leader. Uh, one is uh, be very measured. Don't overreact. Uh, at the end of the day, leaders will always be the places where crises end up. 
And if you become the person that shoots all the messengers or just uh, throws their hands in the air aghast, it doesn't help the organization. So you need to be really measured around that. Uh, you need to be incredibly resilient as well. Uh, so again, CEO role is one of the loneliest. Uh, you haven't got a peer group. Uh, you're on your own. So if you're really lucky, you've got a good family and friend support outside work. But but you are absolutely on your own. And when you're going through the tough times, when you're making the changes that are difficult, that are really hard to communicate and to explain and to justify, but are the right things to do, those are two really good strengths. So you need to have. I mean, I my my style is naturally reflective. Uh, so I. I sort of like to consider the facts and think my way through things. Uh, and that's 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 my style. It's not what everybody wants, though. So as a leader, I also have to re reflect that sometimes they want they want the shoot from the hip. What 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 should I be doing? And sometimes you, I can do that as well. But it's not my preferred style. And so I, I communicate how I prefer to think about things with people. Give me the paper 24 hours. Let me think about it. And I'll come with a much more balanced uh, response to you as opposed to emotively going with something. Uh, the other thing I say as a leader is, is don't take it personally. I mean, you can't be everybody's friend as a leader. Sometimes you've got to take tough calls. I've had to make friends of mine redundant in an organization because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and they've accepted that and we're still being friends. Uh, it's not about sort of being nasty or malicious or anything like that to people. It's just a case of sometimes that's what you need to do. You need to change the shape of the organization or you need to downsize or whatever the, the call is. And and that's that's what I call part of doing the right, not the easy thing. Be easy to say, oh, we'll find a role for them. It's fine. We'll do this or that. But actually, sometimes the right thing is actually you were great. You were exactly the person we needed five years ago, Steve. But now. We've done that part. We need a different person to take us on the next role. And that's the same thing about being a CEO, really. Uh, a CEO is, for me, is like a football coach. Uh, you Sometimes you need Kevin Keegan and sometimes you need Alex Ferguson, two very different types of coaches that bring different things. And depending on where you are in your evolution of your business or your team, you'll need a different style. And for me, that's one of the reasons why CEOs tend to have a lifespan of what, four to five years, generally. Uh, and then you need somebody else to take you on the next next stage. There are very few businesses that that can uh, can have a CEO that actually sees them through many many multiple life stages because it just doesn't work with the individual's skills and priorities. And it's why if you're going to call out people like Alex Ferguson for having such a long tenure at Manchester United and being so successful, that's really unusual. Yeah, it, it is. And actually, if you look at him and his tenure in particular. You would say that change management uh, was was a real key skill of his because when he realised things were getting tired and old and needed to change, he did it in a quite aggressive manner and and took some really tough decisions that that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily take, and that perhaps was one of the reasons why he managed to stay so successful for so um, long. I agree. Agreed. Sometimes uh, taking the tough decisions and making them quickly is important. Mm. I mean, you can let the things, uh, you can, everything would be a, just a slow death if you let it just run on until you have to make the decisions. And that's part of the CEO's role is it's jumping in quickly and saying, this doesn't work anymore. We need to pivot. Otherwise, you can end up being a Kodak and still being investing in, in, in sort of film when really you should be. The fact that Kodak invented the digital camera and then weren't able to really succeed in that market is probably indicative for the same reason that Philips has invented so many great things over in Holland but actually never become a market leader in any of them uh, you just need to have you need to be quite dynamic and, and Ferguson was look, I'm not I'm not a football fan but actually he was one of the guys that that really uh, was successful was he always popular well with the fans yes but people around him not necessarily and sometimes that's how it's got to be mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can imagine him uh, being very unpopular at times in board meetings. <laughs> um, how do you go about leading and evaluating yourself? It's it's a difficult one when you look at yourself. I mean, I'm naturally a, a hard mark. I'll be honest. If you ask me to score anything out of 10, if you get above seven, you've done really, really well. <clears throat> uh, so I have to look at myself and say, uh, what is it? that I'm doing? Can I do it well? Should I be doing it? Is there somebody better to do it? And I'm saying that as going back to my football analogy earlier. Uh, 
about different coaches at different stages. I know what I'm good at. I'm good at the transformational change and the strategy. What I'm not good at or what I don't enjoy, and that's probably why I'm not good at it, is just running that operation that's running perfectly afterwards. It doesn't really interest me. It doesn't motivate me. In it. And you need people who are highly enthused at the leadership level. So for me, I always look at it and say, actually, when's the right time to exit for me and for the business? And I'm not afraid to say there is always that time. So I, I'm one of these people that generally isn't pushed. I'm always gone before that because I think uh, that's, that's what you need to do as, as the CEO. So I'm tough on myself. But I think one of the things in terms of evaluating, you've got to get the feedback of those around you. Are you giving them what they need? Because they need each, when you look at your team, they need different things. Some will need just go off and do it. Just that I'll be, I've got your back if anything goes wrong, but go off and do it. Others will need to check things with you regularly. Other, they'll have different needs and wants, and you've got to make sure that you're serving all those people in, in the right way so that they can all be successful. So I think the sort of, the 360 feedback that usually comes through my board chair into my role is a really important one. He's gone out and talked to all my peers. And, and yeah, I'll get that feedback of actually they think you're doing a great job here. But could you be more clear on this or could you? And, and that is that's valuable because one that enables me to grow. That enables me to understand better what they need of me. Uh, and it then helps me to identify perhaps I'm not the right person for this role anymore. Uh, and and that shouldn't be classed as a failure. That's just a case of there is naturally a right time to move on and take that skill set to a business that needs that at that point. I, I, absolutely. And that kind of leads nicely into the next question I was going to ask, which is how do you know what would you say is a key indicator that, that your leadership is becoming less effective? It's uh, for me, it's a case of, is the business moving forward at the pace it needs to? Uh, so I'm, as I said, I, I'm always very driven. I'm always very motivated. If I was to, if I was to wake up and thinking, right, I'm not sure what I'm doing today. I'm not sure where I'm making a difference. Uh, and I'm seeing a business that isn't running at 100% or 95%. So very close to, to maximal opt optimal performance. Then I feel as I'm not giving the business what it needs. Uh, and, and that's for me is when the, the time comes to go. It's it's a difficult one because we all know as we do big change programs, I've just been doing some really big change programs within Railpen. Uh, this, your energy saps after a certain day and you almost need a bit of a recharge before you can start the next one. And it's when you're in that period, it's a case of what's the thing that's really motivating me and what's the next change that's going to make the business uh, take go up to the next level. How do I keep raising that bar? How do I keep improving the standards? How do I bring in better people? How do I ensure that the standards we set ourselves are very different from the ones we had three years ago and five years ago? If I'm not able to do that, then uh, yeah, it, it's it's I'm not really the right person. Mm -hmm. and, and you touched on there, you know, after periods of in, intensity, taking time to recharge. You know, I, I underline the word recharge there what is it that you do to recharge and get you through those tough periods and 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 you know motivate yourself to go again well the two things i mean I, I think the first is it's really important to have some sort of home work balance so work life balance and have things outside work i i'm not sure i could ever be one of these people that just thinks about work 24 7 i'm very good at compartmentalizing and actually when i to recharge i need to just spend a little bit more time focusing on the things i do outside work and i i look, I, I i love music my first ever job was teaching music when i was 15 uh i'm still passionate about it i don't have time to do as much as i'd like but it's one of those things that is is great and it's a great stress reliever uh and for me particularly when I've just achieved something big, what I like to do is, is then start thinking more. Because often when you're, when you're doing a massive change program, you get very, very involved in it. So you're living and breathing this 24 seven, you're involved in the steering committees, you're talking with people, you're convincing, you're, and then it all stops. And you could easily just sit there and think, great, I'm, I'm chill, relax. For me, I'm th then I either think, right, 
what's next? So it's, it's almost looking forward and saying, right, we, we've got a new baseline. Where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. OK, um, I'd like to focus now a little bit on succession planning and, and, and maybe a little bit on diversity and inclusion as well, because I think they they kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, but I'd be interested to sort of hear your thoughts on on how you've put together successful transitions, either for yourself or for other individuals on the board and, and, and how you've successfully managed a, a succession plan. Yeah, succession planning is one that obviously everybody has on their Remcom and board agenda. And it's one that's been really, I suppose, challenging for me uh, because ideally when you'd enter in an organisation, I thought I knew Railpen very well when I joined because I've been the chairman of the trustee, the ultimate owner for, for, for a number of years. But the reality was uh, you realise that actually all your senior leadership is the same age. They're not going to succeed each other. They're all going to retire at the same same time. So there is still lots of work to do within my organisation about succession plan. But it is so important. We're now doing a lot more work. And I think it's identifying the skills and traits. And, and we're starting with, yes, what's the, what's the almost leadership assessment we're doing at the moment? So we're looking at the leadership skills. We're looking at the gaps and we will help to develop those. Because for me, I want to be in the position when I'm, when I leave this organisation, that succession is, right, which of the three or four good candidates inside the organisation are going to get the role as opposed to having to go external. And I've had to go externally for too many of my recent uh, hires onto the executive committee. And that's not ultimately where you want to go. You want a bit of external coming in. So you've got some different ideas, but you want a bit of internal as well. And it's getting that right balance. But to be successful, uh, I, I think one of the key things is is the right degree of handover and induction. Ideally, you have handover. We know that doesn't always happen. But what you do need is a really clear induction of what's this all about? And it needs to be consistent. And what I, where I've seen things fail for executives is where the induction is performed locally and it's their view of the world. So it's, a, it's as much a perception about the reality than the reality. So I think induction is one of those things that needs to be absolutely standardized. You get you roll it out, you have top to bottom go through the same process. And then you have the one to ones that follow up. And after that, that really build the color on those things. And it's it's very important. We've done some we've done some very recent hiring. We've had two uh, ladies join us as in our sort of uh, uh, functional areas, our general counsel and our chief risk and compliance officer. And they have both been uh, really effective in. Uh, in getting up to speed with with Railpen fairly quickly, but that's spending time with the right people, and and that's difficult. So I remember when I was take, taking over some some roles in the past, and all I was done, all that happened to me was I was given a pack of papers that, that high and told to read through, and I'll understand what's going on. You don't. You get your information by speaking to people, by hearing, by questioning, by challenging, and 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 that's the that's the fast track to learning. So for me. Uh, the direct handover is very important that it's done in as much face to face. And it's made it more difficult in this world where we've been doing things by Zoom. But uh, that is vital. As far as succession. Yes, I'd like it to sort of have a much clearer pattern uh, of who's going to be my potential successors, not just if I fell over the fell under the bus tomorrow, but actually long term. Because part of that is also growing them to the right skill level to be ready before it's needed. Uh, and I say that very deliberately because for me, you have to invest in people in the in the expectation that they want to stay with you. But uh, the, the reality being, they may say, great, I've got a much wider skill set, I'll go somewhere else. But if they leave your organisation with a good feeling and they say good, positive things about being there, yeah, I took my career from A to B there. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still have to go out with a B with the CEO and various other people. That's a good environment and that's the sort of culture I'd, I'd like to have from the organisation. That sort of makes sense to me. And it's sort of you can have that alumni relationship outside that, yeah, it's not because I was in the bottom 10 percent of Goldman Sachs that I was sacked and left the organisation. It's because I was enabled and skilled up to to get the next role. It wasn't available within Railpen or whichever organisation it is, mm -hmm. but they were an integral part in me developing and getting to the next stage. So it's a. Uh, I think that that's important. So we will invest money with people that actually we don't ultimately benefit from in the long term. 
And of course, we'll be benefiting in the short term. They'll understand more about our organisation. They'll have better leadership skills. They'll have better management skills. And that will be uh, very valuable in the short term as well. Absolutely. And, and through that sort of succession planning and, and your work in general in terms of building organisations, how have you gone about encouraging diversity and inclusion? And what are some of the sort of hurdles you've, you've, you've overcome with that? Well, D and I, uh, um, we always call it I and D actually inside Railpen because I don't think you can ever get true diversity within an organisation unless you're inclusive. <laughs> because you can bring in a diverse person if they don't feel welcomed, they'll leave very quickly. So all you've got to do is a churn of your diverse people. So for me, inclusion is the very uh, important thing. And, and there is something about bringing your whole self to work. So not being afraid to be right. Uh, to demonstrate the fact that you are uh, have a different sexual preference or anything like that, just be very open to it and have that culture. Now that's hard for some organisations, but it's something particularly in the last year or so we've been working on hard at Rail and we put in place a diversity, uh, sorry, inclusion and diversity council to work on some of these issues and really to take forward our plans that actually how do we become a more diverse place? Mm-hmm. No, that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, John, we're coming towards the end now. I'm, I'm sure you'd be uh, pleased to hear. Um, I've, I've just got one last question. And again, this yeah. is one that I ask everybody. And if you were sat in my seat here today, what's the one question you would have asked that I pa- perhaps haven't? One of the interesting things I think about regularly is are leaders born or created? And, and I think it's an interesting one for me because I you, you can definitely improve a leader. But I mean, for me, a leader is defined as somebody that people want to follow. And at what age? And I'm very interested by these programs, 7, 14, 21, when they go through the years, show me the boy, man, 70, boy at seven, I'll show you the man. I wonder whether the true leadership ability is formed very quickly. Because uh, and, and that's, that, that one is, is one that I think is a really interesting one. I think you can create great managers. I'm not sure you can create a great leader from a manager necessarily you've got to have something about you that is more in my mind more inherent more sort of uh, fundamental that will that means people will choose to follow you uh, regardless of even if you're in their area sometimes you'll follow somebody that might be in another part of the business because you actually can see what she or he is doing i think yeah they're doing some really good stuff i want i want to follow them and and they're sort of inspiring their team and they're empowering their team and it's creating the right environment and culture so I think that that would be the one I would have gone for. Mm-hmm. And, and again, it's it's a really interesting topic that, you know, born or created or nature versus nurture uh, principle. And, you know, there's there's no right or wrong answer. I think you, you alluded to there, show me, you know, show me somebody at this age and, and I'll show you the leader of the future. There's psychological studies out there that say, you know, by the age of 10, most people have learned the personality and, and their personality trait isn't going to change for the rest of their life unless a major life event happens. Um, and that can change you. But even then, it doesn't typically deviate massively. So th- there is an argument that actually by the age of 10, you've, we've probably already created tomorrow's leaders. Um, and therefore, what are we doing in school to, to, to create the society we want in the future? It's a very interesting one, isn't it? And I, and I tend to agree with that. I mean, I, I think I look back and say, how have I changed in the last 30 years? And, and all I can really say is I, I've I developed some more soft skills. I developed some more hard skills. Uh, but am I fundamentally a different person? Do I think in fundamentally a different way? Or is my value set and belief set very different? No, it's not. And I think that's that's something about uh, about leaders. And look, and leaders take all shapes and forms from dictators through to absolutely compassionate soft leaders but uh they 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 can uh yeah there, there is a time for most of them i mean i i would always like to work in an or, or or be governed in an environment with a benevolent dictator i think that's probably the best place to be uh you don't get many of them that's the problem yeah yeah no absolutely absolutely john it's been wonderful to have you on the show thank you very much for your time and uh let's do it again sometime in the future Thank you, Paul. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.